Well, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Uh, I'm pretty sure the Toronto Star would have preferred to have gone with Rob Ford in hindsight uh, <laughs> over myself. Um, so I'm going to tell you about the research that we've done in the last seven, actually nine years targeting a protein called signal transducer and activator of transcription 3 protein. And it's really a master regulator of the cancer cell. And in 2011, researchers at Columbia University identified it as a master regulator of glioblastomas. And this really came on the radar for us in terms of developing new and uh, innovative therapeutics to target this really hard target in brain cancer. So, um, as was mentioned, um, I started life not as a cancer researcher, but in fact as an organic chemist, where I did my degree uh, in organic chemistry at the University of Glasgow, or um, Hogwarts, as it also looks like. Um, and it was there that I developed a love for molecular recognition, so I made molecules really for um, recognizing and binding to biologically relevant um, substrates, uh, but not really for any medic medicinal or therapeutic purpose. Um, and it wasn't until I went to Yale to do my postdoc um, in the chemistry department that I met Andy Hamilton, um, my then boss, and he said, well, I want you to target STAT3 protein. It plays a key role in cancer, and we want you to make molecules that bind to it, inhibit its function in cancer cells. And the ultimate objective of that was to kill cancer cells. So I've been working with STAT3 now um, for the last uh, nine years. So STAT3 stands for Signal Transducer and Activator of Transcription 3 Protein, which is a bit of a mouthful, so we, we abbreviate it to STAT3 for short. But me and STAT3 could presumably have gone back further. And as you can tell from my accent, I'm not from uh, Canada and I'm not from Toronto. I tried supporting the Maple Leafs, but that didn't help them. Um, <laughs> I'm actually from a small island off the west coast of Scotland um, called Butte. Um, and when you look at Butte and you look at STAT3, there is uh, a remarkable similarity between the two. And so maybe it's fate that I was destined to target STAT3. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story about making drugs, uh, legal ones, uh, not like Breaking Bad, uh, where these two infamous chemists uh, gain notoriety for their ability to make crystal meth. Um, I'm nowhere near as exciting as that, and uh, this story is not going to be as exciting as that either, just so that you know. Um, the most exciting thing I've ever done is dress up as Gandalf at a cheese and wine event at Glasgow Uni. <laughs> So what we're trying to do is to develop a drug that targets a protein called STAT3. And STAT3 is hyperactivated in 70% of actually all human cancers. And it's believed to play this master regulatory role for driving the actual cancer. And it's long been known that a STAT3 drug would be transformative in chemotherapy. So why do drugs work in the human body? Well, to understand that, you have to think of yourselves at the highest echelons of educated society. You have to consider yourself to be an organic chemist. And what you have to think about is the human body, not in terms of muscles and bone and tissues and fibers, but in terms of a large reaction chamber in which lots of molecules are constantly interacting with each other, forming complexes, uh, undergoing chemical transformations to mediate biological processes. Biological processes that can go wrong and lead to uh, cancers. So for example, uh, you look at cis-retinal, this very small, simple molecule. This allows you to see by simply the flexing of this alkene uh, bond. 
there's serotonin, a neurotransmitter, a small molecule that bridges the gaps between your brain cells to allow you to understand what I'm saying today, hopefully. The simple fact is that the targets within the cells are chemical entities that we can react with with small chemical entities, drugs. And we can manipulate their function, their biological function, to exert a therapeutic response in a human system. So when we think of a cancer cell relative to a normal cell, what do we think of? Well, we think of uncontrolled cell growth that cancer cells often exhibit. We think of uncontrolled cell division, they're constantly dividing. They are champion invaders. You can get metastasis with cancer cells. They can spread throughout the body and form secondary colonies. And they tend to be immortal. They resist all the natural cues to die. And everything about a cancer cell is about survival and growth. So if we look at a tumour model, what happens? Well here you have a bunch of cells in a really rudimentary diagram that I prepared. And you get some mutation that leads to the formation of a cancer cell which spreads, proliferates and grows. And then there's the potential for um, these cancer cells to detach and migrate through the blood system to form secondary tumours. Secondary tumours that can occur within the brain where you can get glioblastomas and other types of cancer. Um, you can get it within the lymphatic system spreading to the lymph nodes, um, to the lung and to the liver with colon cancer. Uh, one of the main reasons why patients with colon cancer die is not through the actual primary colon cancer but through the secondary tumours that are formed in the liver. So what happens inside a cancer cell? Here's a really fundamentally uh, drawn picture which is really basic but you can see the main things. You've got the cell interior, you've got the cell membrane, you've got receptors on the outside of the cell and you've got the nucleus where you have uh, DNA. And what happens in a cell signaling process, the, the mechanism by which a cell is told to grow, to divide, to die, these processes are mediated through really complex and beautiful pathways of proteins interacting with each other in this signaling cascade of interactions which ultimately leads to gene regulation. And in a cancer cell this is programs which allow it to divide, to proliferate, to grow, to form tumours and to not die. So what do we target? Well we have to target specific proteins in these pathways that will give us the optimal effect, in other words in cancer, for the cell to die. And in our case we targeted STAT3 which is part of a signaling pathway known as the JAK-STAT pathway. And it upregulates genes such as MYC, VEGF, BCLX cell and MCL1. And what these genes do is they cause cell division, they cause cell growth, they prevent cell death and actually they're involved in tumorigenesis, the actual formation of tumours themselves. But STAT3 is involved in normal cells as well. But in normal cells STAT3 is turned on for just a couple of seconds to an hour. It's a transient activation which is then shut down very rapidly by the natural system. There's blockers out there to turn it off. In cancer, however, it's been found that STAT3 is permanently switched on. So it's continuously producing these genes that are telling the cell to keep growing, to keep dividing. The processes by which tumours are formed. And this is one of the major problems with cancer cells is that they have permanently switched on STAT3 activity where you have this upregulation of genes that drive the cancer phenotype. And this leads to drug resistance. Most drugs uh, aim to initiate cell death, but if you've got a gene, a transcription factor that's telling the cell not to die, 
it's actively fighting the role that the drug is trying to play. Um, this is the uh, study in Nature in 2011 uh, that I was telling you about from the Columbia researchers. This made it into the BBC News uh, where it was, these researchers went so far as to say that STAT3 is one of two targets that you should be going after if you're serious about targeting glioblastoma uh, brain cancers. So our research goal in the, the gunning group, as, as, we're coined, as we're known, is to use medicinal chemistry to develop a STAT3 targeting drug. Um, so the first question is, well, what is medicinal chemistry? Medicinal chemistry, at its most fundamental level, is the design and synthesis of molecules which bind to a target protein with exquisite potency and selectivity. And the result of this binding interaction is a biological response. And the biological response, typically in cancer research, is cell death. You want to have the effect of that molecule binding to your target be that the cell wants to die or commit suicide. So why do you need to have it potent? And why do you need to have a molecule be selective? Well, you want it to be potent because you want to use as little of it as possible. So the more potent a molecule is, the less of it you need to fulfill the desired uh, role that you're wanting it to play. The more selective it is, the less chance that you're going to bind to lots of other different proteins. And all these other proteins are performing their own unique biological function. If you're binding to lots of different proteins, if you have a promiscuous drug, the side effects are going to be toxicity because you're hindering and causing lots of problems throughout the biological system. So, to give you an idea, the typical drug dose is one milligram. That is around 10 to the 18 molecules. That's a lot of molecules in your typical drug dose. However, the human body contains 10 to the 14 cells. Inside those 10 to the 14 cells, each cell contains 10 to the 10 molecules. So if you do the maths, and I can't do that, each drug sees 10 to the 6 molecules as a potential target. That's a one in a million chance that you're going to bind to your target protein. And that means that when your molecule does bind, you want it to stick. So that it stays bound for a long enough period of time to exert that biological effect. So selectivity is very important. So ultimately what we're looking for is a drug that will kill tumour cells and will ultimately have no effect or very little effect on normal cells, particularly in a cancer patient where a very small majority, minority of cells are actually cancerous. So your drug is going to reach every major organ within four minutes. It's going to be able to interact with lots of different cells. You want that effect to be minimal. <coughs> Unfortunately, with a lot of drugs nowadays, um, there is a lot of toxicity associated with them because they do kill normal cells. So in our case, we're targeting STAT3. And STAT3 by itself is not actually a problem. The problem with STAT3 is when it forms a dimer with itself. And it's active when it forms a complex with itself. And what we want to do is to try and develop molecules that break this complex. And the result of breaking this complex is that it becomes inactive. So how do you design molecules, small molecules, that go in and target a big protein complex? To give you an idea, um, this is the relative size of aspirin um, compared to uh, STAT3, this little thing here. So it has to go in and it has to break open this complex. And drug molecules have to be small. If they're not small, they don't get into cells. If they don't get into cells, they don't hit their target protein, and then you have no response. So here's a wee video that my graduate students prepared, because I could never do this. <coughs> and this is actually a crystal structure of STAT3 uh, dimerized. 
with DNA bound in the middle here, you can see uh, DNA here. And what you can see is that this protein has actually mediated this complexation event. You can see this yellow part of the protein, it binds to either side. And what we wanted to do was to try and mimic this part of the protein and use nature's own method of binding to STAT3 to inspire the design of new molecules that could bind to the protein and actually outcompete another STAT3 protein and disrupt this complex. So what did we do? Well the first thing that we did was we did a computational screen. We screened thousands of different molecules to see which one would bind to the protein in a, a, an in silico environment. And what we found was this compound here, S3I201, um, was an active STAT3 inhibitor. And it had an IC50 of 90 micromolar. So what's an IC50? Well, that's the concentration of drug that's required to kill 50% of the cancer cells. And the lower the IC50, the better, because you want to use as little concentration of drug as possible, because the more drug you use, the more chance you have of having toxicity. So in actual fact, the number that we're looking at, we actually want that concentration to be around 0.5 micromolar, so minuscule amounts of drug required to kill the cancer cells. So we had a long way to go at this point. We then docked it within the active site of the protein. And when we docked it, you can see that the molecule only really binds to two of the main pockets. And that was a problem for us because in order to have better selectivity, you want a molecule that complements that protein exquisitely so that it doesn't bind to other proteins, but just to that one specifically. So what we decided to do was modify the structure. And we were going to change the structure so that it bound into this upper pocket. And it, a bit like a jigsaw puzzle, we're trying to add bits that allow it to fit better. And what we did was we added um, benzene type functionality to this nitrogen atom. And we then started our our, our program to develop these inhibitors. So we didn't just put one benzene type derivative in that position. We put hundreds of different groups in that position because we don't know which one's going to work. So we have to try lots of different things. So to do that we have to do and use organic chemistry. And organic chemistry is everyone's favourite subject uh, at university and at school. Um, Biologists don't like us, they think we're glorified cooks, um, but it's because they have an inferiority complex. <laughs> and it's because chemists can make molecules that even God hasn't made, <laughs> like Viagra. <laughs> Ke chemists can turn old men on. <laughs> so. For every molecule that we make, we actually have to do a number of different steps. We have to synthesize our final molecules. So in the case that I'm going to show you today, it took 300 molecules. Each step takes about a day to do. So that's 300 times 7. It's a lot of days, basically, uh, to make this library compound. And it's also extremely expensive. And you need to have... Uh, really talented PhD and postdoc students working on this to be able to synthesize these molecules. This is not trivial. Um, speaking of biology, um, when we first started our lab in 2007, we had this little lab. So this is the building at University of Toronto. So this whole corridor was biology. So we grew our group. So in 2009, we took over this little lab and they weren't very happy. In 2011 we took over this lab and we got some more office space and they were even more upset. And then in 2012 we stole this area as well. And in 2013 we got one of their little rooms here. And in 2014 again we stole their last ending corridor. So if you've watched Game of Thrones, chemistry, <laughs> chemistry's coming. So this is my goal to eliminate biology from this corridor. <laughs> So 
what's the first thing that we do? Well, we've now made our library of compounds. So once we've made our library of compounds, what's the first thing that we test? Well, we don't test in cancer cells first. We actually test against the protein in isolation. Because if the molecule doesn't bind to the protein outside of the cell, it's never going to bind inside the cell. So we actually screen, we do experiments where we screen the entire library against the protein. And what we're looking for is a molecule that sticks, and, or several molecules that stick. And they're ranked and they're taken forward. And they're taken forward into selectivity studies. And the selectivity studies involve looking at other proteins. Do they bind to other proteins? And ultimately what we want is our top rank molecule not to bind to other proteins. We want to have a selective compound for our target. And if it doesn't bind to other similar proteins, then obviously we have a good compound. So the next step is to go into cancer cells, where someone like Dr. Singh will evaluate our compounds in cells to see whether they have a response. And that response has got to be death. We want to see the cancer cells dying. And once we do see that our molecules kill cancer cells, we then again come back to selectivity. I can kill cancer cells with bleach, but we're not going to be treating patients with bleach. So we then look at selectivity again. We take normal cells and we screen the same compounds to see whether those compounds kill normal cells. And ultimately what we want to see is no effect on normal cells. And again, this will then rank the compounds for going forward into further study. <coughs> what we then want to do is we use biologists. Um, and uh, the biologists check for us to see whether we're actually on target. So they look inside the cell using cell biology to see whether with increasing concentrations of our drug, do we see a decreasing amount of our target? Are we inhibiting that target? Are we knocking it out? And this here is your STAT3 protein. You can see with treatment with this compound, it's decreasing. Again, the next step is to see whether, obviously if this works, to see whether it targets other proteins inside the cell. So we look at other proteins that we think there's a chance that it's going to bind to. And with increasing concentrations of our drug, we really want to see no effect against other proteins that actually could be beneficial. Okay? <coughs> so if we see no inhibition of off-target proteins, again, that means that this molecule is going to go forward. And when it goes forward, it goes forward into animal trials. Animal trials where we engraft human tumours onto the mouse and we look to see whether there is a therapeutic efficacy of our molecule against this particular uh, type of cancer. And not only that, we're also looking at the safety of this molecule. Does the mouse die as a result of treatment with our drug? Does its liver get trashed? Does it have a heart attack? Does it have a stroke? These are all things that we're looking for, as well as efficacy against the solid tumour. So where did we start? In our programme we started with this molecule S3I201, which was 90. And we performed our first step, and our first step in this case was to replace this oxygen. And when we replaced this oxygen with an N-methyl group, we actually lost activity altogether, so we were pretty scared that I wasn't going to get tenure um, because you need, to, you need to be successful at U of T or else you get fired. Um, so I lost all activity whatsoever. But I was still confident in our idea that if we functionalised off of this nitrogen that it would bind to the protein more effectively. So we put on a benzyl group and it was 300 micromolar. We put an aphthyl, 280. We put a paracyano, 260. Terbutyl, 194. Biphenyl, 115. Cyclohexyl benzyl, 4. So this was really exciting because this molecule was 20 times more potent than our starting molecule. So this went forward. <coughs> but we're chemists, we weren't happy with four, we wanted to make it even better. So we then fixed another part of this molecule, which was this end, and we made two different classes of compound. 
in these two different classes we made around 50 different new molecules where we kept this new group in position and what we found was that we had a number of really good compounds and one of these compounds as you can see here um, is BP1102 and it's got an IC50 of 0 0.5 so this is 180 times more potent than the original compound at killing uh, cancer cells. So what did we do with this molecule? Well we took this molecule and we screened against normal cells and what we found with normal cells and what you've got here in this bar graph is the number of cells that are present but with increasing concentration of drug you can see that the number of cells is not affected. So healthy cells and all these three different types of uh, cell line there's no effect on the number of cells. It's not killing healthy cells. In cancer cells, however, what we found was that these molecules with increasing concentrations um, really potently suppress the number of cancer cells. It's killing them. So this was great, and it moved forward. And it moved forward to cell biology studies where we looked to see whether there was an effect inside the cancer cell. And what we found was, and here's our STAT3 protein here, and these are compounds that didn't work outside of the cell. They didn't work inside the cell either, which was no surprise to us. But with our best compound, we found that we completely abolished STAT3 activity inside the cell. <coughs> so then we went into animal studies. And this is a breast cancer study. And what you can see here is the size of the tumor growing after 15 days. It's growing to over a centimeter in size in 15 days. And this is the tumor that's been cut out of the mouse at the end of the 15 days. At one milligram per kilogram, we saw that this molecule suppressed the tumor significantly. So there was no toxicity in the animal. So we up increased the dose. And when we increase the dose, we see complete regression of this tumour entirely. It's completely gone. Um, this is in another study where we looked at the ability of this molecule to suppress a tumour um, in mice models. And what you can see, this is our control. This is the tumours that are lit up. With treatment with this compound, you can see complete uh, curing. So this is multiple myeloma, which is 100% lethal um, cancer. Uh, there is no cure for this particular cancer, and this molecule is extremely effective in treating this cancer. So I just wanted to show you something else, which we think is kind of cool. So. This is a marker, a fluorescent marker, that reports on STAT3 activity. So if STAT3 activity is on, you see this fluorescence. And what I want you to look at here is, and these are all little mice, um, I want you to look at the time here, eight hours. So this is in the control. You can see that there's lots of STAT3 inside these tumors, firing away, causing the tumor to grow. So within an eight hour period with treatment with this compound, we can temporarily shut down STAT3 signaling entirely in a very time dependent and dose dependent manner. We can switch off one protein's activity and this leads to the results that you saw where you have complete tumour regression in these animal models. <coughs> so what about brain cancer? Um, so for brain cancer we modified this molecule um, because we knew that it wasn't getting into the brain. So we modified it um, in the most simplest of ways. Um, this is salicylic acid here, which is present in aspirin. Um, and what we did was we simply deleted this hydroxyl group because it's more water soluble. And actually to get into the brain, you need to be kind of fatty. Your molecule has to be fatty to pass through the blood brain barrier. So we deleted it. So this molecule, we chopped off this hydroxyl, so it was just a, a benzoic acid. And this molecule is called SH454, and it's named after the student that did it, Sina Hafchinari, uh, Lab Book 4, Reaction 54. This is the molecule that he made. And what he um, found was that 
in brain cancer cells, and this is stat 3 here, with increasing concentration of drug at the tiniest of concentrations, uh, we were completely knocking out this protein in brain cancer. Uh, and this is actually some of the most potent inhibition of STAT3 that's been um, reported in uh, brain cancer. <coughs> and actually the most potent for targeting this protein full stop. So what we then did with David Kaplan at SickKids Hospital, we screened against a whole bunch of patient brain tumour um, ste uh, stem cell cancer cell lines. And what we found was quite remarkable. We found that this molecule um, was killing the brain cancer cells in some cases at 0.09 micromolar concentration. So the tiniest of concentrations was required to kill brain cancer cells. Um, and this is a thousand times more potent than the starting material that we, we first made. This is to show you in healthy cells. In healthy cells, this molecule has zero effect whatsoever. So at concentrations a hundred times what it's killing the cancer cells at, it has no effect on normal cells, <coughs> which is obviously good for a, a cancer patient. So we then went into animal studies and what we wanted to see was, well, as I mentioned in the, the, the session earlier, you need to get a drug across the blood-brain barrier to have an effect in the brain. So it's, it's actually a very difficult problem to get a molecule across the blood-brain barrier. Very few molecules actually do it, which is why brain cancer, uh, dis in, in top, on top of all the other surgical difficulties, even making molecules to target brain cancer is harder than other cancers. <coughs> what we knew was that we needed to have a concentration that was um, around 0.2. What we found was that we actually had concentrations of about 0.7. So we knew we had enough molecule getting into the brain to have a, a biological response. So what happened? Well, this is the brain of a mouse. This is a slice of the brain. And stained in white is the actual uh, brain tumor cells. This is a really aggressive glioblastoma um, and what we did was we treated with our molecule and what you can see is uh, almost complete regression of the tumour in a living system um, and you can actually see the morphology of the brain is much healthier as well than in the actual cancer model uh, with treatment and this is one of the most aggressive uh, brain cancer lines as well. Um, so we were really excited by, by this uh, data. Um, and just to show you, um, this is the, a slice of the brain as well, where we use um, biology to look for activated STAT3. And actually, all these dark little dots represent activated STAT3. And when you treat with our molecule, you can see that STAT3 in the brain is actually being shut down. All these dark spots are disappearing. And I just want to show you this molecule has so many purposes. This is colon cancer. Um, this is the liver of a mouse with, without colon cancer. This is the liver of a mouse with colon cancer. You can see this metastases um, form huge tumours on the actual liver of the mouse. But when you treat with our molecule at 5 micromolar, you completely stop metastasis and the liver goes back to normal. Um, and just to show you, um, so this drug that we've got, it's going to go into phase one clinical trials in psoriasis. Even though it's an anti-cancer drug, the same protein that drives psoriasis, Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome, lupus, um, MS has even been indicated, also drives um, brain cancer. And this is the normal skin of a mouse. Um, this is the dermal layer here. And then when you treat with, uh, this is a mouse with uh, psoriasis. It's all inflammation, it's all swollen up. You treat with BP1102, that's the first compound that I showed you. There's not really much of an effect, but you treat with SH454 
then the skin almost goes back to normal. All the inflammation disappears. Um, and this molecule has also been in trials for MS, and in 12 mouse models of MS, it works. It works really well. So all 12 mice were cured of MS. So the key point really is that um, the STAT3 protein is involved in so many different diseases and really our funding came from breast cancer research first to fund the development of this molecule that we've subsequently been able to go into brain cancer and to look at this now seriously as a brain cancer therapeutic. So we have a, a venture capital group who have now invested 14 million dollars who want to do phase one trial in uh, psoriasis first and then in brain cancer and then in multiple myeloma. Um, and so my hope is that within about a year we might have something that would go into phase one in um, brain cancer but we're not there yet and the, in fact medicinal chemistry and cell biology and cancer research throws up so many different things that you absolutely do not expect that can delay the uh, clinical trials and we've had it already we were meant to be in clinical trials um, six months ago and we had a metabolism issue that we had to fix chemically and now we're at a stage where we have something with a much longer half-life that is more suitable. So I hope I've shown you that we've gone from S3I201 which had lots of different targets, was a very poor drug and rationally designed SH454 and actually the lead compound now is AM1141 um, which is the one that's going to go forward which is on target maybe um, you never know. Um, we've tested for 800 different off-target effects. We haven't found anything yet, really. Um, so we're hoping that uh, it's on target, but regardless of whether it is or not, it's still a very potent anti-cancer drug. Um, and I'd like to thank, this is my research group at U of T, um, and the people to mention uh, is Sina. So Sina developed SH454, He's now finished his PhD and he's off to Harvard to do a postdoc um, down at Harvard. Um, and David and Ahmed, who you know, I can't find here, he's here somewhere. Uh, he's developed the AM1141, which hopefully is the molecule that's going to go forward with brain cancer. Um, and I'd like to thank all of the sponsors who uh, have supported my research throughout the last um, seven years and U of T who hired me when I was pretty young so they took a bit of a chance and it worked hopefully <laughs> um, and I'll just finish with a wee story I take my students out onto since I've been in Canada I love kayaking um, I've never kayaked till I came to Canada and I absolutely love it so I force my research group to come out onto Lake Ontario every year with me because they don't want to do it but it doesn't matter because I can fire them um, <laughs> So they all come out and I uh, had to sign, so we took out 10 boats and, uh, or no, it, was, it was, may have been 20 boats and you had to put down um, a $1,000 check for each boat, so I had to sign this thing saying, if they sink, I have to give you a $1,000, so I said to them, don't sink the boat. So halfway out into Lake Ontario, uh, Sina's boat's tipped over, he's flailing around in the water. I've never kayaked so fast in my life, not because my graduate student was in the water, but because I could see a thousand dollars sinking to the, to the bottom of Lake Ontario. So despite being in North America for quite a while, I'm still a Scotsman. Um, and thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions.